and welcome to another edition of Ease Art Tips. So today I'm going to make a condolence card for a friend of mine um, whose husband passed away. He was born in 1929 and lived a really wonderful life. So you may ask, why do I have this glass sitting on top of my card, which my card is sitting right here. Um, I'm going to do a circle and I looked around my house to see where would, if I had anything that was about the right size of the circle and I did, it was this glass right here. So I'm just going to literally draw a circle using this glass just to give me my circle that I need. So there is my wheel. Easy peasy. All right, now the next thing is I'm looking at what you can't see on screen is I'm looking at some references of old wooden uh, ship wheels. And they seem to, for the most part, have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spokes to them. But eight seems to be pretty common. So we're going to do eight. And I do want to get this mostly right. I do like the wonkiness of what comes out of my brain, but at the same time, I don't want to be completely off. So I'm moving this over. I'm not going to do a direct measurement. I'm going to do a nearby. So it's at, what, three and five eighths. And that's a little bit hairy to find the middle spot. So I'm just going to kind of move it over and giving a little bit of space so that I can find the middle spot of three and a half rather. That'll be a little bit easier to do. That should be about right there. All right, so my middle is going to be about right there. Okay, so now I want to do the actual tines. I don't know what you call these things of this steering ship. So I'm going to try to get this as straight as possible. I'm lining up with the fold on my car. A little bit off, but we've still got to add some dimension to this, so that's pretty close. So it looks like there is a circle in the middle where they obviously fix the wheel to the thingy that stands up. That's an official term, the thingy. Um, and then that basically looks like the wheel of a pirate ship. And then that'll be spokes. And I don't want to lose this ring. The handles of these wheels are on the outside, so I'm going to have to bring this circle in quite a bit so that I can get some dimension there on these spokes. So that's about, well, actually, let me get our ruler again. That's about a half an inch. That's probably pretty good. So I'll just go around and draw. So I've set up my wheel and I'm now making the spokes. I am looking at some photo reference that you can't see. I just pulled up on Google what these things look like and I'm going off of kind of an average of everything that I see. Because I don't know about you, but I don't have a pirate ship's wheel laying around for reference, do you? All right, so because I traced that uh, glass, I have my circle, so the rest of it I'm just gonna eyeball. And it looks like the next circle that would be coming would be this inside circle. And there's another circle inside that. It's pretty substantial. I imagine these things are substantial to hold up to the storms that they would have to deal with. And the spokes have lots of different shapes. And I'm looking at them, and I think the one that I like the most does something kind of like that. Oops, my lead must be running out. It's trying to squish up on me. I'm almost done. Just do that for five more seconds. There we go. All right. So the next thing is it looks like we've got some screws that hold things together. Let me get my lead where I can use it. Uh -huh. Lead's really long. It gripped again so I can get a little bit more usage out of it. And yep, looks like they've... Now why would they have that there? That makes no sense. I'm not going to put that there. All right, so I'll just get rid of that one. Dimension's always nice because it just adds a little bit more detail and care. Without these details, it looks kind of like clip art, which... We don't want this to look like clip art. Now, I want to think about using a lily because this is a tribute for someone. So I'm looking up lily. So it's not just any lily, it's a calla lily. Let's see if we put, to kind of lace a calla lily through here. I always like to have things in odd numbers. There's a zen about it. It's in landscaping, especially. You always plant an odd number of bushes because when you come to that landscape, you complete it and make it even. The rule of three, the triptych, Shakespearean three-act play, all of that. 
We always work in threes, always in odd numbers. Also watching out for tangents. I don't want things overlapping in places where it makes it confusing to the view of what we're looking at. So we'll see how this turns out. One more, maybe. Getting that full of three. Okay, now that is pretty confusing looking, so I've got to figure out what I want to keep and what I don't want to keep. So I'm going to get my erasers. Remember, I told you I'm not a snob about erasers. I'm going to get rid of what I don't want in my image. These are some new um, cards that I got online. Uh, I will admit the watercolor cards are so much nicer to deal with. This is just a cardstock and the pencil mark kind of dug into it a little bit, which I'm not very pleased with that. It's also like a fraction of the price of getting actual watercolor paper for cards. I think I can tell what I'm going to do with this, so let's see if I can now start inking in. I want this to be a fairly light line, so I'm going to use a Unipen, a one-point Unipen to get this in here, because I really just want it to be my guide more than anything else. Well, sometimes I uh, really impact getting really nice line quality. For this one, I really just want it to be a guide, so I'm drawing very sketchy and light, which is also a bit of a type of line quality. Probably gonna have to turn the page to get all these curves in here. All right, so I've got things overlapping all over the place, so I gotta figure out how these things overlap. So I've got a time happening here with bit of, looks like the leaves of a calla lily have a little bit of a wavy edge to them. Notice I missed making that line up with that. That's on purpose. If that had met, that would be called a tangent. You can see I'm avoiding a tangent again. You want to avoid tangents because they make the image confusing as to what goes where, what's going forward, what's going back, that kind of thing. Right, I do have to turn the paper. Sorry if I make you dizzy. Try not to. So I'm drawing what I'm sure I'm going to be able to see. You probably notice I'm making a few minor changes to the drawing as I go through. The sketch is really just a guide. All right, this is the tricky one. I think. Almost at a tangent there. We got a little bit of a tangent. These are actually separate stamens rather than coming off of one branch. So I'm going to have to draw that as if it's coming out. Down here, they have very long, long stems. Did I say stamens or stems? It's stems. Again, see, no tangents. Could have had some there, but I avoided it. All right, the rest of these leaves are going behind the wheel. I remember visiting their house in Florida and they had a wheel like this over the fireplace. In fact, it might've been the wheel from that ship that he was so integral to retrieving. Right, we've got that. I'm gonna put the middle in a little bit. We're missing most of that hole there. Covered that up. All right, gotta get these last leaves. All right, so now I'm looking at a tangent here. So this is, this is problematic. So this leaf right here, I can have it coming like this where you don't see it at all. I gotta make sure that's pretty substantial so that you don't start thinking that this edge is the edge of the leaf. And that's what's problematic about Tangents. You don't want it to be confusing, so I am definitely going to make it look as if it's cutting right through where we can't see. And there's one more leaf that's going to go behind. Do I want that? Maybe just a little one. And you've got to remember to sign your work. And let that dry for just a second. Now I go in with an eraser and I get rid of all of that pencil. And it seems to be coming up okay, so I'm not too displeased at this point now with this paper. 
We'll see how it deals with the paint. Okay, so that is my pen line, and as you can see, it really is very light. It's just a guide for where my color is going to go, but it's still a little considered line. I'm not showing light direction, but it's got a sketchy quality to it. It's got a very delicate feel, and I like that because it's a delicate situation, delicate mood. So I'm going to use something today. Now this is sent to me by a guy who does these products. I've, I think I've showed you the watercolor kit before. This is by Artsy. This is a gouache paint set and the little lid pops down like that. And this is my first time to play with it. So I think this is a good exercise to use. And you can see it's got a padded top. When you open it up, it's got all the different colors that are available. I love yellow okra, sienna, burn umbers. These are mostly the colors I'm gonna be using today. Maybe some olive and some lemon. So these are kind of neat. Now the neat thing about gouache, gouache is basically a watercolor, maybe uh, has a little bit more chalk in it. Um, and just like watercolor, it can dry and then be reconstituted. Now these are still very wet. These are pretty big. Wow, that's a lot of paint. Um, I'm going to use a palette that looks like this. Now this is a great palette for using watercolors or gouache because it comes with these little containers. And what you could do is put liquid paint into these little containers, keep them uh, safe like that. But the nice thing about gouache and watercolors, you don't have to worry about them drying out because they can be reconstituted. You just add water and they come back and that's one of the great things about them. But the nice thing about this particular palette is because you've got these wells, because these actually angle, the water comes down here, you can put the pigment, you know, bring the, pull the pigment up. Because it's not really paint until water gets added, really, at least with watercolor. So we're gonna play with that and play with this. So I'm gonna pull out a few colors. So I'm gonna do that there. Now the other things I need obviously are some water and a brush, which this brush has, it's a pretty big brush, but it's got a nice point to it. Um, I've got some other ones I can show you. This is my brush kit. So I just keep them in this little bamboo wrap thing. See all my little brushes in here. Now, you're not gonna wanna use the same brushes for say, oils that you would use for water-based paints like uh, watercolor and gouache, um, cause you have to clean them with different things, with solvents, you don't want solvents in your watercolor, that kind of thing. Um, so these are all watercolor brushes, which are a little bit softer, a little bit finer. The oil brushes are gonna have a little bit more of a coarse hair to them, because oil's just a little bit of a rougher um, medium to work with. All right, so I'll find my favorites. Now what happens is as they age, you lose that point on them. You can see it starts fraying out. So I'm actually probably do some new brushes. So if I look at these, which one has the nicest point? I think actually the one I had out first, so we're gonna stick with that one. But look at that, that is really big. Huh. I might wanna go with the smaller one. What am I doing here? Yeah, let's try this one. Now this is a Da Vinci Fit for School and Hobby. Was not terribly expensive, it's number four. Uh, the size tells you how the width of these guys. And if you can hear my neighbor upstairs walking around, they got some very heavy feet, sorry about that. Anyway, so I'm gonna try this out over here because I don't want to splattering what happens when I pull the plastic covering off. Not too bad. So there's our yellow ochre. Okay, I'll pull up a few of these out. I don't want to do all of them. The sienna. <laughs> I didn't get it on me. That's the other thing you need, a paper towel. I'll tell you the, the texture of this paint, it looks like pudding. Really beautiful. Makes me want to eat them. The chocolate. <laughs> I guess that would be caramel. Pistachio? I don't know. Olive green. That's a nice green. That's a good green. I like that. I'm not going to open up my sap green. And I'll tell you why. 
One of the things I see a lot of beginning artists have issues with is green. Um, they just get it too verdant. And yes, we've all seen that green out there in the world of greens, but it's not really the dominant one. The ones that you see more of tend to be more towards these olives, towards some yellow greens, and a lot of yellows, to be honest. But a lot of people, when they start painting with green, they start using this sap green, and it's just, it, it's too bright, it's too saturated. So let's see, so we might use some yellow green. I'll pull this one out. Yeah, they are stomping around up there. It's kind of like Christmas opening these up. There's a lemon yellow. Pale yellow, that kind of looks like a cadmium. That is one thing I have noticed about the paints with these artsy kits, they're not always called what you would equate them to as far as a fine art material is concerned, but that's okay. If you know your colors, you know, you kind of have an idea what this is. Now that looks like a true cadmium. Might use some yellow orange. You'll notice two things I will probably rarely open are the titanium white or the black. And it doesn't matter that it's titanium white. I barely open a black or a white, um, especially with acrylics and gouache. Those two colors can make a color look really chalky and just pull all of the saturation out of them and make the, it look really flat. So a lot of times I'll see beginning painters, you know, they want something to go lighter, they put white in it, and all it does is it makes it muddy and chalky and it, it just kills it dead. So if you can, try to stay away from the white and the black until you get to the very end. Maybe you might need a little highlights or something like that, but otherwise I'd try to avoid them if I can. That's, that's a pretty color. So this one was called, was it Bamboo Blue? That's pretty, I like that. And we might, believe it or not, use a tad bit of cerulean. Looks like I got two blacks. Well, there's ironic. I'm not going to use either one of them. All right. All right. That's all I'm going to open for now. That's all I think we're going to be using. All right. I think I've got this set up where you can see the drawing and see my paints and see my palette. Now, my husband just got home from the grocery store, so you're going to hear him a little bit. Moving around. <laughs> he says he can't wait. Yeah. Do your thing, sweetie. Okay. This will be an interesting one. All right, I'm gonna start on the wheel. On the what? <laughs> I'm gonna start on the wheel. Are you gonna to talk to me one day? <laughs> I'm not talking to you. <laughs> I've been doing these videos and it's funny because I mean, the second you start filming, you know, somebody knocks on the door, the phone rings, there's a siren going by, you can't, this is life, you know? Just deal with it. All right, so I'm going to use a little bit of what I think is their yellow ochre. And that's not much. Well, it's not much. You don't need much. Now with gouache, you can add a lot of water to make it act more like a watercolor, or you can just keep it kind of um, opaque, not add a whole lot of water, and then it's more like working with an acrylic. When I worked at Buster Brown Apparel, um, we mostly worked with gouache, actually. It's been a long time since I worked with gouache, but that was our primary medium. And all of us, we had to deal with a lot of paint that matched the fabric that the, um, the samples department was working with when they were making samples. So we would mix our colors in these little ketchup bins, you know, those little plastic things. And Every single one of us, there was a stable of artists of about 16 of us, and um, every single one of us had a huge collection of those little ketchup things with all of our little colors and matching fabric swatches. And I remember one artist, she left her collection of ketchup thingies too close to her trash can one night. Yeah, you know where this is going. So the cleaning crew came through that night and they threw away her entire collection of mixed colors which we're talking a uh, week's worth of work, you know, to re reconstitute and re-come up with those again. 
But again, that's one of the advantages to um, to gouache is that we could just put our mixed colors into those little plastic tins or plastic um, containers and let it dry. And when we needed the color again, we could just come back in, add water, and boom, we had the color back again. Now the reason I'm starting with this yellow ochre is I'm trying to start with a lighter color and I'll get darker as I need to. Now yes, gouache is more opaque than watercolor. You can work from dark to light more so than you can with watercolor. You can't at all with watercolor really. Um, but it's still a good idea that this is a um, subtractive medium. You guys spraying all of your food when it comes in? We're still doing that too. Stands over there spraying away. Say hi, Stan. Hello, Stan. Ha ha ha. We've got the neighbor upstairs stomping around. My husband's getting groceries. This is just, yeah. This video is going to be a little bit different than the others. Now you may notice, yes, I am married, but I do not wear a ring. Partly because my hands are my tools, but also when he lost his ring, I was like, well, I'm not going to wear mine. Fine. I actually have a beautiful ring. I should probably wear it more often. Also, when I teach at Holland's in the summers, when I'm actually able to go there, I love brushing the horses. That's how I calm down. That's my zen. And it, the first few times that I went up and was petting the horses and all my ring kept hitting their noses and that, that nose bone, I was like, oh, I'm hurting them. I don't want to hurt the horses. Off came the ring. See, now I'm, you can see I'm actually having a little bit of uh, trouble with the control of this brush because it is an older brush and the, um, the point is pretty much lost on it. Probably not as bad as those brushes you have to play with in you know, elementary school or something where they're like little fans. But it still do, I can do some new brushes. The next book contract that comes in, I'll get some new brushes. Gouache can be really tricky to get good at. When I was in college and I was taking my color course, which if you are an art student at some point, you will take you'll take a color course. And we worked with gouache, and it's really tricky. Partly because it's really saturated, and it's hard to get a very pale color with gouache. I missed a spot. But these calla lilies are going to be a bit of a challenge because they're going to be really light. We want them to look like they have life, but we that's that problem with getting a light color without making it look chalky and dead. We'll see if we can pull that off, huh? Getting rid of the yellow ochre, just washing my brush. And I want a little bit of red. So I'm going to use this what was this? I think it's a sienna. All right, now this I'm going to add a lot more water to because now I'm starting to not want as much opacity. Try a little spot, see what we get. This is also where the um, paper towel comes in handy. The funny thing about the paper towels is that when you're pulling up something wet, um, they will oftentimes leave a texture behind, and I actually really like those textures that they leave behind, so it's something I don't mind doing. See that? Kind of cool texture. All right, so I'm making my decisions as to where my light is coming from as I'm painting, and it's obviously coming from above. Most light sources do, so that's an easy default. So already you can see the difference, how much more pigment I had in my brush up here versus down here, and it's actually working much better down here. So I probably should have put more water in than what I had.
and I can't spin it. It's a very tight space. since I work with gouache. In some ways, gouache is really great for doing posters and stuff like that because I, I think it's hard to blend. I, I have a hard time with it. But um, it's great for getting shapes of color, which of course is a very poster-like effect. Now, the my issues of blending um, gouache are really my own. There's some amazing gouache artists who have done amazing things. Tony DiGalizzi works a lot with gouache. Um, another really great gouache artist is Vernon Grant. He created the Snap, uh, Crackle, and Pop characters for the Kellogg's cereal, Rice Krispies. And he was actually from the same town where my university is, Rock Hill, South Carolina. So he's a local hero here. Kind of cool the impact that an illustrator had on this little town if you haven't heard of these artists i'll put a link in the um below my video so that you can go look them up all right we're starting to get a little bit of dimension to our wheel i want to go in with one more color give it just a little bit more the more of a value scale that you can use from one to Ten, the more it's going to look realistic and pop. So I'm going to go in with this dark brown here. Won't need much of it, and I am going to mix it in with the sienna. I don't like that dark mark I just put down, so I'm going to I cleaned my brush and I'm pulling it back up. A little bit of clean water. Those others I'm just leaving wet, they'll, they'll dry. When you go in with your dark value, you, you don't need a whole lot. A little bit goes a long way. So when I say use that entire value scale, that doesn't mean you have to have black everywhere. You can have just a teeny bit here and there and it will get the message across. So this card is actually for a veteran and war hero, Robert Eddington. So he was a commander in the Navy. But when I knew him, it was this clan of the family that would all go down and meet at the beach house in Florida. And we would just play and take out the float boat and go crabbing in the bay. We called it aggressive crabbing because we would take a, a flat float boat out into the shallows and we'd all sit on the edge of the boat with nets in hand and when we'd see something gray under the water moving we'd jump out and go after it and it was usually a crab. And the strong guys, they could get a whole bunch of crabs in their net at the same time. I could usually only get about two or three tops because they got heavy. Of course they're trying to get out and we'd have these feasts. I had a lot of fun with Robert and his family. I always felt very honored and privileged to be part of all of that. I'll include more information about him below. Pretty special guy. Starting to run out of my dark there. I need a little bit more. You can see here, we're really starting to get that dimension. And I've talked to you before about this, about how light on dark makes the light pop and dark on light makes the dark pop. Well, here we've got light on dark and so that calla light is coming forward. So with that in mind, I'm gonna make a few more spots like that so that those callas really will pop off the wheel when I get to them. It's gonna be a long video. I'll speed up a bunch of parts. This is where I would turn it around if I could. I've got it trapped under here. Because I want to take advantage of the broadside of the brush to get a bit more sweeping shading. It's a little tricky from this angle. 
can you imagine a bunch of people, gosh, we were all ages, kids to adults, shouting, there's one, there's one, go get it, and people running through the water and trying to trudge through the water to get to some dark shadow that you know is trying to, is going to turn around and try to come after you, which they did often, so you always did this in sneakers, which is hard to swim in sneakers, but protected your toes. All right, that's getting closer to where I want it to be. A little bit more light happening there. So when I worked at Bus Brown and we were working with the uh, gouache all the time, part of the reason we did it is because we were oftentimes doing patterns on acetate. And acetate is a clear plastic. And the reason we did that is because then you could take that clear plastic with the painting on it and lay it against the fabric to get an idea of what the final print was going to look like on the fabric without actually printing the print. Which is all going to sound extremely alien to all you guys who have grown up with only computers. This was all done by hand. Alright, now I have actually just wet my brush and I'm going over some of the paint and because and this is something that gouache can do that watercolor doesn't do so much. It can reconstitute with some opacity. So it is actually, I'm actually blending it a little bit right here. But it's also picking up, which is what watercolor does. You see that spot right there? Yeah, don't do that. It's a tricky medium. It takes some practice and I haven't had it in a long time. So I'm kind of glad to have this kit makes it a little bit easier than going in with all the tubes, which I have the tubes too, but I would have to, as you saw in this kit, I'd have to go fill those all up. You can also see how we have obliterated the line just about that I drew. Unlike with watercolor, which is transparent, this is opaque and therefore it is going to cover up your line, which is why I wanted just a delicate line. Okay, I think that's the wheel for now. I might come back and do a little bit more to it after we see how the callas come out, but let's do the callas. All right, so callas are green down at the bottom and they come up in a smooth gradient to a white at the top. Some of them are pink, but typically when you're talking memorial, they tend to be white. So we're gonna kind of mostly go with the white ones. But we're going to start at the bottom. We're going to start with the dark green and move our way up. So here's where the sap green comes in and it's actually a really nice color as it is. But I am going to add a little bit of yellow into it. Now I don't want to sully my colors so I'm going to clean my brush before I do and I'm going to use some of my cadmium yellow, what I assume is cadmium or this would be equal to like a light cadmium hue. So I'm going to start down here. Of course I'm going the wrong way. If I was doing this by hand or without you guys, I would probably flip this over. But it's much easier to pull paint or the brushes toward you than away from you. Because they splay when they go away from you. Okay, so this has a lot of water in it and this is where it's now behaving more like a watercolor which is how you get those lighter colors. You don't add white, you just add water. I think that this is casting a shadow on the leaf, but I also want there to be dimension, so I'm not gonna go too dark with this. I want it to look like the leaf is away from the wheel. I'm using the vein of the leaf as a divider because it's gonna kind of go like that, so it's gonna be darker towards the center. I don't know if you notice, I just did a little twist of the brush to try to get it up on a point a little bit better. It's one of those things that wears out your hand muscles when you're drawing is you're actually twisting things quite a bit too when they're in your hand. I used to teach uh, beginning drawing at the John C. Campbell Folk School. I get a lot of people who had just retired and, you know, wanting to get back to art and that kind of thing. And 
it was a very intense class. It was a weekend long workshop. And by about halfway through Saturday, they were oftentimes, you know, like, holy mackerel, because their hands weren't in shape for that kind of activity. And they didn't realize how much muscle control was necessary to, um, to be able to draw the way they wanted to. And it does, it takes practice. You know, you just got, you've got to build up those muscles. It's like jogging. Can't go out and run a marathon the first day. And it's things like rotating the brush like that. Those are the things that need that muscle control. It can make your hand tired. So if you're just starting and you're not getting the control you want, don't get discouraged. You've got to work it out, you know, just like you would at a gym. You've got to get in shape. Oh, see, now this is better green. It's got more yellow in it. Let's get some nice yellow. I'll tell you, I think the cadmiums, the cadmium yellows are probably my favorite colors to have in my palette because they are just so flexible and can brighten things up and liven your, up your painting so well. So light cadmium hue and cadmium yellow. Those are my go-tos. Okay, we're going to do a little bit more contrast in those leaves. We'll come back to that because I'm going to move up a little bit. Get a little bit more of this cadmium. Kind of in the green. Yeah, let's see, we're now moving into a, a true chartreuse. So when I'm mixing my greens, you can see I, there's no blue in there. This is a sap green and cadmium yellow. Now where I might bring in blues that are in some shadows, but that's a slightly different goal. All right, I have a tricky thing I have to do here. I have to create a gradient that goes up from here and does not sully the white. So I'm gonna put a ton of water and a tad bit more of that cadmium. And I've got to twist my hand up in a really strange way to do this. Okay, not too bad. I've got out of work for just a second. Again, I'm trying to get on the side of the brush. It's a bad thing I got out of the back of the card. Mm. Trying to figure out a work around there. Oh my god, I'm getting it all over the counter too. <laughs> I'll come off on that at least. All right, now I'm going back in with um, my water. So I'm cleaning my brush, and I'm going to kind of try to do some lifting here. So this will create. Um, Bring my gradient up higher. There we go. Because I don't want a line here. All right. That got that. And I've got a yellow stamen that sits in a bed of a little bit of shadow. Same thing, same method, trying to create, get on the side of the brush. All right, again, clean my brush. Come 
I'm gonna lift some of that out. Okay, it's getting a little bit of dimension there. So I really wanna, now I'm looking at those leaves, I really want to bring in some brightness on those leaves. Yeah, a little bit. So there's that yellow again. Now, again, it's wet, so it's not only just laying pigment down, it's also picking up some of the paint. So it's creating a little bit of life in there. Yeah, it's doing what I want it to do. Get a little bit more dark on this bottom one just to contrast with that light. All right, now the stamen is yellow. But I'm going to make it a greenish yellow because that's kind of our theme going on here. All right now, just a little bit of that sienna into it down at the bottom. All right now, I want some dimension up in the top of these petals as well. So here's a trick. How am I going to do this? I think, well, for one thing, I want a little bit more depth at the bottom of this. I want a little bit more sap green. I think what I will do and stick with this theme of a slightly greenish yellow, but a ton of water in it. I'll come down off the point. Again, I'm getting up on the, the side of the brush. Most of the pigment kind of welling towards that point there. Again, that's that dark on light concept, you know? I want it to pop off of that light background of the card. Yeah, that's working okay can give it a little bit more depth down towards the bottom of the flower. There we go. Now contrast is what gives you that impression of light, and I've kind of lost it in this bottom leaf here. So I'm going to go in and pull some of this out. So it's just a wet brush. I'm literally pulling the pigment up. Because if you have two values, next to each other that are too similar, like they were right there, it makes your piece look flat. Because your eye is trying to figure out well, where do they stand in space? And if there's no obvious thing going on, then that's where your eye goes because you're trying to figure it out. And your, your brain is confused. Confusion is never a good thing when making art. But now on this side, I do want it to go darker. Okay. What am I going to do with that? I don't know. I'll figure it out. I'm, I'll probably sign it on top of it or do some funny little thing. See, it's an opportunity. It's called a happy accident. Huh. I'll probably sign right over that. Make it look like a little logo. Alright, you're seeing the paper pill. This is, this is the difference between a good quality paper and not. This is not a good quality paper for watercolor or gouache or anything like that is why the paper is pilling. It can only take so much water before it starts going, I give up. I'm going back to pulp. All right, fixed it. <laughs> Done. All right, so of course they'll be looking at the front more than the back, so that'll be all right. I can clean that up just a little bit more. So what did we learn today? We learned to keep a bunch of clean paper towels on hand. That's what we learned. But hopefully we learned a little bit of coming forward, going back, and how to create, how to work with gouache, and the differences between gouache and acrylic and watercolor, and the advantages of some of them. And maybe you'll go try it too. So again, I wanted to, uh, if you want this artsy kit, this gouache kit that I've shown you, um, I will put a link to it in the, uh, comments below my video. You can get all those groovy colors. And I hope that you were able to learn something today and enjoy it and have a good time. So I will see you again on Ease Art Tips and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks. Bye.